Good evening and welcome to the Hari Hui. After one week of rugby, we are back and we saw some thrilling games over the weekend played in traditional rugby conditions, Adam. Well, unfortunately, the sun went into quarantine last week. Only six minutes of sunshine in the capital, but it was good to have rugby back almost poetically ironic in such pitiful but rugby-esque weather. Exactly right. And, uh, of course, one of those stars from the weekend that uh, won the game for Huddle Boys Marist is our guest tonight. He has scored nearly 900 points in Wellington Club Rugby. Of course, he holds the record for the most points scored in a, in a match when he played against Ruma Tucker in 2013. And he has also represented Hora Fanua Kapiti. So our guest tonight is Brandon Lawson. Brandon, thank you for coming on the Huddy Hui. Uh, tell us about Saturday's game versus Oriental Rongatai, which was played in those terrible conditions. And tell us about those two impressive, impressive kicks you got, the drop goal and the penalty from a reasonable distance. Yeah, oh, like, like I was saying, um, it was pretty uh, crap, crap conditions out at Ori's, which always <laughs> seems to be the case, um, just to add to the challenge. But um, oh, in terms of the kicks, like uh, we, we were down on their line in the first sort of 20 minutes, plugging away, but we didn't really come away with any points besides Celeste's try. But um, uh, I, I sort of thought in the second half, we need to sort of take any points we can. And um, yeah, I suppose that the penalty kick sort of nudged us out in front uh, a little bit and then the the drop kick was just a bit of a spur of the moment thing to... We had the advantage, so there wasn't too much pressure on it. It was pretty ugly, but got the treats. Explain what happened with the drop kick, because I understand it took a deflection because it died like a balloon as it was approaching the posts and then eventually wobbled over. Yeah, I wasn't sure it was actually going to go over, but I heard some of the boys celebrating who were close to the post, so it gave me a bit of confidence to turn and jog, but... um. Yeah, yeah, it actually got charged down partially, so lucky enough to get it over in the end. And the penalty kick was from 50 metres, so tell us more about that because you've been very modest about what was a mighty kick. Oh, there's a slight wind, Adam. But um, <laughs> no, nah, I, 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 I feel like I just judged it well, I guess. Um, like I said, we needed points uh, just to keep pushing ahead, so just gave it a good whack and managed to keep it online. The size of your Ford pack is massive. How much of a difference does that make in the weather that we saw at the polo ground on Saturday? And how much optimism does it give you for the season ahead? Yeah, oh, I, I've actually been told we're one of the smaller packs going around, besides the, the Manaya boys up front, um, <laughs> who are obviously, you know, big boys. But um, no, oh, yeah, we're just going to um, have to keep muscling up front. Uh, with all these, all, all the big four packs out there. So, as well as terrible conditions on Saturday, um, there were a hell of a lot of penalties in the game. Um, Adam and I probably thought it got close to nearly probably between 30 and 40 penalties in that game. Um, it's definitely being passed down from Super Rapi. So, what's your thoughts on these new interpretations of the rules that that um, that have been applied at the moment? Oh. It's something that we're all in the same boat, so we're all going to have to get used to it. I think um, it was always going to be expected first game. Boys are pretty eager to get over the ball and steal a bit of, bit of ball for for our boys. But um, no, we, we've we've talked long and hard about all the new new changes. There's not actually any rule changes; just the interpretation of how the refs are going to look at things. So it's just about making those clear pictures and and being disciplined, I guess. So, of course, um, your upbringing was up in the Harafanua. Um, tell us about your upbringing, uh, what college or school you went to, and also your family's involvement with rugby. Uh, I was actually born and bred in, um, in Lower Hutt. His uh, dad was down there playing rugby for, uh, for Huddle Boys Maris at the time. Um, and then we moved up here when I, oh, just before I started college, I think. And I ended up going to Carpety College. Um, and yeah, it was obviously a beautiful place to grow up, Carpety Coast, um, and I'm back up here now. Uh, I absolutely love it. So um, in terms of my family being involved in Horofanoa, dad played plenty of games for Horofanoa um, with his brothers. Um, and then he obviously went down and played a couple of seasons for Wellington as well. So yeah, pretty, pretty lucky to have those guys 
uh, to look up to in terms of rugby. You had uh, four family members in first class rugby. Name them and tell us more about each guy. Well, there's, there's Dad, who, who was obviously first five, so it, it's probably where I sort of got the the goal kicking and, and whatnot from, and and the lack of tackling. So I've been told. But um, uh, then there's Uncle Donald, um, who's obviously the speedster on the wing. I think he's got, holds a couple of records for for tries scored for Hoff Noah. Um, and then there's my Uncle Bruce, who was at the front row, and my Uncle Grant. I think he played in the midfield. Um, and then my grandfather actually was involved somewhere along the way as well. So, yeah, plenty of family ties. And in terms of your relationship with uh, Dad, how much rugby did you see him play and what were the most valuable lessons he installed in you playing the sport? To be honest, I don't remember too much uh, watching him play necessarily, but um, oh, he, he's been huge for me, uh, you know, taking me down the park from a young age teaching me how to kick and it was uh, sort of every Friday night would be down there, not for a game, practicing and he'd, he wouldn't exactly critique me, you know, hard out. He would just sort of give me little pointers here and there. But no, he's always been someone that I've, you know, looked up to and strived to sort of follow in his footsteps. Um, but yeah, no, he's been good. The Heartland Championship is in your blood. What did it mean to play a season for Horofunua Kapiti and what were your emotions when they cut the competition because that affects an extraordinary number of players? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. It was obviously a really proud moment to play for Horofunua, um, obviously with the family ties. Uh, and then hearing the news um, that they're going to cut the comp was, was pretty heartbreaking. Uh, and I've got a lot, lot of good mates that play um, in the Heartland team here and play local club footy and they're you know they love love the game just as much as as you and I so it's disappointing but um you know hopefully we'll be back up and running next year I'm not sure what the goal is but yeah obviously it's, it's been a funny old year let's hopefully the Heartland Championship does play next year Adam uh, you know some fantastic games of rugby there and we've called a few of them particularly up in Harafanua um of course, you've had a long association with uh, Huddle Boys Marist. Uh, tell us about how you got involved with the club there and some of the key uh, influences at the club. Yeah, so, you know, obviously going up, going to school up in Carpety, it's, um, you know, we we played first with Dean and all that, but we did sort of never really, uh, couldn't quite mix it with the big big schools. And uh, after, after school, I, I sort of wanted to kick on in my rugby and mum and dad thought it be a good idea to go down and play um, at Huddle Boys Marist. Obviously, Dad had played there before, had a few connections. So, um, yeah, I went down there. I wasn't expecting to play Premier Rugby or anything like that, especially in my first year. Um, I got the call up. I think it was Matt Lee gave me the call to come and play against uh, Wainui, I think it was, my first, first start. But oh, I've had heaps of, um, you know, mentors and no coaches and players have been awesome. Obviously, um, the Risden brothers, are, you know, they stand out for me. They, they've been real helpful over the years. And, and obviously, with Nick Beck helping out uh, coaching, he's, he's been awesome, um, you know, as a, as a player, coach and, and a mentor. You scored uh, 52 points against Rimataka in 2013. Explain what happened that day, because 52 points is the Wellington Club Rugby record. Oh, it was just it was just one of those days where everything clicked, I guess. Um pretty unfortunate for Rimataka. They they they, they couldn't have picked the worst day to play Hot Old Boys Maris at, at the nest. It was a beautiful sunny day, so it was a good day for running rugby and yeah, I guess I was I was on the end of the chain for a couple of tries and managed to kick my goals. So there was one point you were losing when the score passed a hundred. It wouldn't fit on the scoreboard. <laughs> Do you remember that? Yeah, I wasn't taking too much notice of the scoreboard, but I heard about that afterwards, that there was a bit of a bit of a fault, yeah. There's a lot of chat that goes on during club rugby matches. What do you say when it's such a thrashing like that? Does it change the context of the conversation? Oh, yeah, your heart goes out to, to those sort of teams that are, that are battling away, like you don't know what's going on. Um, you know, within their club or whatnot, they might have been struggling for numbers. And we, we had a pretty good gun team that year, so... 
like I say, it was just unfortunate. Fortunately, they caught us on a nice sunny day. So yeah. it was a record-breaking performance, but obviously it's not necessarily your favourite individual display for Huddle Boys Maris. Which games really stand out in your memory from an individual standpoint? Oh, it's hard to go past the um, 2013 uh, semi-final, uh, Jubilee Cup semi-final against Ori's, um, mm. the 100-minute game. Yeah, we didn't even win, but it was just, that stands out um, right at the top as, as probably my favourite game to be a part of. Obviously, a um, few All Blacks involved and, yeah, going into extra time. So, um, that's one that stands out. Obviously, a few McBain Shields. Uh, it's obviously a big one for Huddle Boys uh, versus Patoni. So, I've won a couple and lost a couple. So, that just goes to show how, you know, how, how much they mean. Mm. So... Of course, you're captain of Huddle, Huddle Boys Maris this year. And in 2017, you were captain in the Jubilee Cup final. Of course, not many players in their career get to experience the Jubilee Cup final. And unfortunately, um, that day, um, you know, what's it like leading a team out on such a big occasion? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that was big. I did have my mate Sheridan with me. He, we, were, we were sort of co-captains then. Um, but yeah, no, that was that was huge. Like everyone wants to play in the Jubilee Cup final, and uh, obviously, I, I'd missed out in 2014. I was down south, so um, that was my first chance at the Jubilee Cup. Obviously, didn't get the treats, but uh, it was a pretty quality OBU side that day. Um, but yeah, no, awesome experience. You served a suspension in that period before the Jubilee Cup final as well. What did you learn about yourself in that period of suspension? I think you might be talking about Sheridan there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let him know that. <laughs> no, that's okay. I was. Uh, we'll move on from that. And so, uh, in terms of uh, last year, you won the Swindale Shield ten matches in a row, and then uh, things unravelled a little bit in the Jubilee Cup. What's the team going to do to ensure that doesn't repeat itself this year? I think um, you know that we've had it. We've had a big talk about uh, how we want to look as a club, and that's on and off the field. So, just trying to get the little things right, and and, and be, uh, I guess, take it week by week, and and be better each week. Um, obviously, it was a good start in the weekend to take points away from from the polo ground, which isn't easy to do. And hopefully, we can build on that this week, and just yeah, keep growing and keep getting better every week. You mentioned uh, Sheridan Rangahuna. There's a new guy playing halfback this year. Tell us about young Wayland Tuhoro Robinson. Yeah, no, he's, um, we've actually been lucky to get a couple of guys from, from another club. He's obviously Avalon boy, but um, oh, he, I was pr- bloody proud with how he played in the weekend and that, in those wet conditions. He's, um, he's obviously got a lot of potential and, um, you know, we're lucky to have him on board. He's a, he's a good kid. Tell us about what you do outside of rugby, um, your the job um, and other hobbies that you have. Uh, so I'm a builder. Uh, so it's me and my old man. Um, got, got our own business. Um, let's plug it there, first five builders. But uh, <laughs> nah, uh, oh, I'm pretty chilled out guy. Just, it's just me and my partner and the, and the dog at home. We live pretty close to the beach, so... Every chance we get, we're, we're down there and we're actually renovating a house at the moment, which takes up a lot of our time. Uh, fantastic, fantastic having you on uh, the Huddy Hui tonight, uh, Brandon, and all the best uh, uh, for your game this Saturday. Cheers, boys. Thanks for having me, eh? Thanks, no Brandon. No worries, mate. Thank you very much. Cheers. Well, Adam, um, you know, what a great experience. Oh young man that um, Brandon is, um, particularly uh, with what he's achieved to the game. Yeah, Brandon is one of the better players going around Wellington. There's no question about that. He's scored nearly uh, 900 points in senior rugby. Prodigious uh, boot from a great uh, rugby uh, family. And he uh, deserves a lot of the applauds that he has had in his uh, career. And Huddle Boys Marist evidently play Wellington this uh, Saturday. That's a big game out at High Tido Park because... Wellington are celebrating their 150th anniversary, and they too won in week one, 17-14, against Avalon. Matt Horson, the brother of Wes Horson, the Hurricane, kicked 
four penalty goals. So Wellington standing up in tough conditions and winning in similar circumstances to uh, Huddle Boys Marist. Huddle Boys Marist beating Auries by 11 to 3. Early try by Silesi Rayasi, a real spectacular dash over 30 metres. And then it was scoreless for the best part of an hour before Lawson stepped up at the end. There are very few good goal kickers in Wellington Club Rugby. In all honesty, uh, Lawson is uh, one of the best. And that 52-point uh, haul against uh, Rimataka, that was the same season that Sosetu Mavave scored uh, 50 points as well. That's for right. Porniki and of course uh, Sose was a wonderful player who kicked on to represent Southland. Well, yes, he did. He also um, was a, made the New Zealand schoolboys, but um, unfortunately, he suffered a lot of injuries. Poor old uh, Sose Tumabavi. So, uh, you know, it was great to see him back on the field playing for Southland. Of course, Adam, it's the anniversary of the '95 Rugby World Cup final, and of course, uh, most New Zealanders know. Um, there's a, the, the alleged rumour that Susie was involved in that uh, particular final. But what a unique, unique occasion the 95 World Cup final was, of course, with the big plane flying over the top of uh, Ellis Park and also Nelson Mandela walking out onto the, onto the field wearing their infamous number six jersey. Well, in this uh, climate of racial tension, I wonder if Nelson Mandela could accomplish a feat like he did in 1995, combining the contentious emblem of the Springbok jersey, which to a lot of marginalised black people represented oppression. And yet he took the best parts of that complicated emblem and used it as a symbol of unity and respect and honour. And South Africa won the World Cup final that day in incredible circumstances, extra time drop goal to Joel Stransky, 15-12, the final score. So many memorable moments in that game. Yapi Mulder, who has since died, the 80-kilo centre who knocked down Jonah Lomu, 120 kilos flying for the corner. Ruben Kruger passed away of a heart attack at 39. He was denied a try, and Ed Morrison later admitted that it was a mistake, that he didn't reward Kruger with the score. Chester Williams, who was the sensational black winger in that team. He has passed away as well, but he scored uh, four tries in a game against Samoa and scored in the opening match against Australia. Incredibly risky thing for Nelson Mandela mm. to embrace the Springboks. And for them to win the World Cup was a spectacular achievement. And I actually argue that the Springboks could be regarded as the most successful thing that's happened in post-apartheid South Africa. Now, it hasn't always been perfect. South Africa is a deeply troubled country. The RAND is plummeting. There's a prolifically high murder rate, one of the worst in the world. A shortage of electricity, a shortage of water, terrible corruption in uh, politics. Yet since rugby went professional in 1996, South Africa have won the World Cup three times, which is more than any other country. Since the sport went professional in 1996, they've won 61% of their internationals. Only the All Blacks with 83% have won more. But get this, the policy of racial quota took a long time to be embraced mm -hmm. and accepted. And again, it hasn't always worked. But in last year's World Cup final, there were 11 black players in the South African squad. Six started the final, memorably against England. And in 2019, when South Africa beat Australia 35-17 in the rugby championship, mm. there were eight players over half of the Springbok team were blacks. So integration in rugby has worked and South Africa have also maintained their merit as one of the finest rugby teams in the world. Exactly right. And of course, seeing Seal Kalesi lift that World Cup uh, trophy last year was another memorable moment in the uh, rugby sporting landscape. It was incredibly emotional to watch Khaleesi speak so strongly and convincingly about poverty, about issues off the field, which England players could not really relate to. And I suspect if England had won the World Cup, there wouldn't have been the same outpouring of emotion or the same construction of a narrative in regards to their victory. The other thing that has surfaced this week 
in regards to South Africa's triumph at the World Cup last year is the remarkable strength and durability of Rusty Erasmus. He mm. was undertaking a cancer therapy, and yet he overcame that to guide South Africa to the most unexpected victory. 18 months before the tournament, mm. they were in complete disarray. In fact, they came to Wellington, and if they didn't win that night, Bowden Barrett missed four kicks, and South Africa scored that spectacular victory. There's every conceivable possibility that Rassi Erasmus would have been sacked, but yeah. Rassi Erasmus's great achievement as a Springbok coach is he recaptured their identity. When we mm. think about the Springboks, we think about hard, organized, ruthless forward play. In South Africa, from an aesthetic point of view, did very little to advance the game of rugby. Frankly, they were boring to watch, but they played like South Africa and it worked for them in a tournament format and they are the world champions. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're not. But no. 24th of June, 1995, a milestone in the history of rugby, perhaps the most important day in the history of the sport. Well, exactly right. And of course, uh, speaking about South Africa and Wellington, uh, last year and the year before, they won in 18 and they drew last year as well. They scored that try right at the end to draw the game. So uh, the, the rivalry between the Springboks and the All Blacks is still going strong. Well, it's the greatest rivalry in world rugby. Started in 1921. The All Blacks have drawn two tests nil all, one of them in that series, and the other one against Scotland in 1964. The All Blacks in South Africa played that great series in the first year of professionalism in 1996, mm. and the All Blacks won the second test in Pretoria, 33-26, to capture the series. Jeff Wilson, who went from Goldie to Baldy, back to Goldie, back to Baldy. He scored two tries when he had a haircut that week. I always remember that as a 10-year-old watching that test. But South Africa always in constant uh, challenges with their mm. uh, corrupt and ever-changing political situation. But the Springboks, through thick and thin, really have been still one of the most successful things to come out of that country. And that should be celebrated. Exactly right. And what also should be celebrated is that we're up to round two of the Swindell Shield. Adam, and of last week, there were some uh, rather entertaining games, including the battling conditions out at the Polo Gram of Owing to Rongatai and Huddle Boys Maris, and Huddle Boys coming out on top there. But um, this week on the uh, Etu Whanau footy show on Te Puka o Te Ika, uh, Adam, Julian and myself will be commentating alongside Darren Larson in the Wainui versus Batoni fixture at William Jones Park this Saturday at 2.45, and they are playing for the Darren Larson Trophy. Uh, Darren Larson, one of the better coaches in uh, Wellington, involved with the Hurricanes presently. He's been a stalwart of both the Wainui Mata and Batoni clubs. Can't wait to work with uh, Darren Larson. Very mm. fine rugby brain, certainly better than ours. <laughs> <laughs> and the Wainui Mata batoni game is always a doozy. They've played each other many times over the years, but in the last uh, five meetings... Uh, two of them have been split with a draw. So that just illustrates how close yeah. the recent rivalry has been. Last week's results were contrasting. Batoni 34-5 victors over Johnson Bull. Logan Henry, two tries and 19 points. He's mm. a very underrated player. Exactly. Logan yeah. Henry, when will he ever get a run for Wellington or another yeah. NPC team? I thought he would have been close last year because he had a fantastic second round last year. Uh, fifth, uh, first round and second round. Of course, Pre he was the second highest point scorer in the first round last year. Uh, precisely. And mm -hmm. obviously, he's in good form again. The thing that is happening at Batoni this year is they've really bolstered their depth. Yeah. So they've had a good back line for a long time. Perry Peroni. Willie Tafui's back from a spell in uh, England. And Jared Adams is there. But they've got some good... Young, new forwards, Josh Houston Tupo, who played mm. all those games for Upper Hutt, and Josh Souther and Yona Apaneri from the New Zealand Secondary Schools program two years ago are involved. So, Batoni, who have struggled for four depth in recent times, will travel over the hill with a good deal of optimism against him. Why don't we mount a team on paper last week that looked really strong? Yeah. Peter Umunga Jensen, yeah. Ruben Love, the young schoolboy sensation from Palmerston North some experience in the Fords with uh, Terry Time and Matt Jacobs, but they imploded against uh, Tower. Apparently their lineup 
and scrum was a schmozzle. So they're going to have to shore that up. But Tony always brings out the best in Wainui Amata. But the villagers on form might be the narrow favourites. Well, that's right. Who knows, really? But um, it's always a bit of battle between Wainui Amata and Batoni. And, of course, being at William Jones Park, it's uh, one of the toughest places to go and play rugby, but they often have a fantastic after-match afterwards. Yes, always look forward to the William Jones after match. It's always the worst place to get home from as well. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that's definitely the game week. Of course, um, there's another big game, Old Boys University against North, Northern United. OBU had a good win against Paniki last week. Uh, and Northern United had a hiccup against Maris St. Pat's with their team that were a bit like Wainui, but even more stacked. Well, MSP are going to be good this year. Aidan Morgan and... Jonathan Tamatini are a very solid half and first five pairing. And Tom Martin and the Thompson twins and Willie Schultz on the wing. MSP have some depth, although there was an interesting result in the reserves with Norse slamming the MSP yeah. reserves. So Norse perhaps complacent heading into week one. MSP have been very strong in the past against uh, Norse. They won the game last year too. Mm. So Norse perhaps unsurprisingly going down in that one, in that uh, context. OBU, they had a solid win against Porneki. Again, the platform was laid by the Fords. Wairangi Parata, the young hooker, scored a nice try and was very competitive. The Norse team, though, will bounce back hard. Parakura Lalanga is an exceptional leader and they might make some selection changes too mm. given the, the likes of Fafili Lavave and Campbell Woodmass were left out last week. Well, that's right. And so definitely two games uh, worthy of contention, but we want you to listen to the Edu Whanau Footy Show. Starts at 2 o'clock. Coverage starts at 2.45 on Tia Puka Ika with host Dave Piper, myself and Adam, and also Darren Larson. You can also watch tonight's Huddy Hui later on tonight. It will be up on Spotify and also YouTube. And we're also on a number of other platforms very soon on Higher Heart Radio. So yet again, Adam, thank you very much for coming on the Huddy Hui tonight. Thank you, uh, Brad. And uh, thank you all for coming on and watching us just after the winter solstice. Ciao for now.